I saw a video recently. I think it was uh, Ovid that sent me the video. All of them that were being mentioned in the video, all of them are fake. And they were fighting each other. One said that he's confessing. He's, he's confessing. The place he's confessing is also the place of... Uh, of uh, let me not say anything. Komaka. The place he's confessing is among the things he's saying. But he says he's confessing because all of them are competing for, for the souls that are available in the city. All of them. It's just the beginning. Very soon it will become obvious that the places where certain people are gathering is not the assembly of the called out. By the time we will begin to read the Ephesians now, you will be the one to judge. Because, you see, human beings are looking for meaning to life. People are looking for meaning. People are looking for peace. People are looking for true love. People are trying to find fulfillment, understand why they exist. But when they come to church, or when they come within the four walls of our denominations, what they find is that we are trying to, we are trying to feed them with the things that will not solve the problems that brought them. So a man enters into a, an assembly, and all he's hearing is about how God wants to give him money, and all of this, and all of that, and all of that. But he, he, he's trying to ask questions like, why do I exist? What is the meaning to my life exactly? How do I find purpose for living beyond eating food and wearing clothes and looking nice? How do I find a greater reason for my existence? And when they can't find answers to those questions, they settle for something that is not enough. And we continue to mutate and mutate and mutate. So what does the Bible say is the purpose of the church? Let's begin. Let's begin now. Are you getting blessed? You are getting blessed. Say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 to 22. Remember that Paul here is speaking to Gentiles. Right? Um, most of the time in Paul's letters, Paul tries to distinguish between the Jews who were sons and daughters of the covenant and the Gentiles who were engrafted, brought in by the death of Jesus. The promise originally was to the Jews. But every one of us that are not Jewish by birth, we are all Gentiles. And what happened is that we are now engrafted. We are made partakers of the commonwealth of Zion. So Paul is saying here now, now therefore you are no longer strangers. Yes, you are a Gentile, but because you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are no longer a stranger, you are no longer a foreigner, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, Paul goes further in the next verse to show you that he's not speaking about a building, a physical building. Next verse. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, by the time you look at the foundation, first of all, we have become members of a house. Are we together? Every one of us have become members of a what? A house. And that house is called what? The household of God, like we saw yesterday. Number two, the foundation of that house is that we are being built on who? The apostles, the prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief. So every one of us must be able to go back to look at it. What did the apostles teach? What did the prophets teach? What were the teachings of Jesus? Because that is the foundation for the building. The apostles, the prophets, 
and Jesus Christ being himself the chief corner stone. Because I'm going to show you by the time I'm wrapping up as the Lord grants me grace, that if, we're, if the restorative agenda of God will begin, one of the things that must happen to our generation is that we must go back to the scriptures. We must go back to scriptures. We must become such students of the Bible that error and heresy becomes things that we can easily identify. And it's not that you become a police, an error and heresy police. It's so that you will be a pillar that can uphold truth. You must go back to the scriptures. Why? Because that is the foundation of the building. It means that if you don't build with the apostles, the prophets, and the cornerstone that is Jesus, what you will raise is not the household of God. It can be a house of entertainment. It can be a house of um, giving bread and tea every Sunday. It can be a house of, of fashion design. It can be a house of many things. But if it will ever be the household of God, the foundation, the building blocks. And you see, the foundation is very important. You can't put the superstructure on something that is non-existent. And by the superstructure, I mean the other parts of the building. The substructure, which is the foundation, is most important if the building will ever survive. My brother, Reverend Tolu, is around. I went to see him yesterday, and then he was breaking my heart again. I was hearing about one, one, one thing that has happened with one man of Anna. I was like, what, what, what is this? You know why our buildings are not surviving? Eh? Because the Bible says that if you don't build on the rock, if you build on sand, when the storms and the wind and the rain comes, the building will what? Collapse. It will collapse. So the reason we are having so much moral failure in our ranks, the reason we are having thieves in the pulpit, the reason covetousness has become the order of the day amongst believers. The reason somebody is wearing the kind of things you will wear to a club and say it's going for Sunday service. And then we are saying that oh, what God is looking at is the heart. Hmm. The person will even climb place. I went to one place one time. Hmm. The sister could not climb the stairs. They thought it was a fizzy, a fizzy. So a brother, a brother will stand here like this and do his hand like this. Huh. Then every sister that is climbing will hold his hand like this. Because some of them, they're scared. If they attempt to do like this, now, prah! So the brother has to be there. They will put their hand, then he will help them up. I say to come and worship. Nothing is sacred anymore. The reason we are seeing many of these things is that the thing that was used to erect that building is faulty. It's faulty. And you know the thing about a building mm -hmm. is that if it is faulty from the foundation, cracks will begin to show on the wall. Is, are there civil engineers here? Anybody in civil? It, it will begin to cracks will show on the wall. And you see, sometimes if you will ever correct those errors, you must destroy and begin again. So the, sometimes when God wants to heal the Ecclesia, he will first of all bring a hammer. Brah! He will destroy. And then he will begin to build again. Because the foundation upon which the household of God must stand is the apostles, the prophets and the chief cornerstone that is who Christ next verse in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into what a holy temple in the Lord 
You can't use the word grow for something that is inanimate. Are we together? Um, um, I think you would have done this one in KG2. If you went to a good school, you would have done it in Kretsch. Characteristics of living things. Characteristics of what? I still remember my own Mr. Ninja D. Is it not true? What is G there for? Growth. Some people can't remember Mr. Ninja. You went to Auntie Caro. Auntie Caro. G there is for what? Growth. Non-living things. Things that are not animated. Inanimate objects. They don't what? So that thing there cannot be speaking about a physical building. Are you here? He says that everyone in whom the whole building, the whole building, being fitted together, fused together. This is why in Acts chapter 242, part of what you see as the pattern for the church was that they were in fellowship. Fellowship. What that fellowship was to do was to help them what? Fit together. It's for fitting. So they went from house to house eating bread. And the Bible says praising God. The one I like most in that verse of scripture is with simplicity of heart. Simplicity of heart from house to house. House to house. It's not a question of trying to outdo one another. You know, some te when you are listening to some testimonies, you know the man is just trying to brag. He didn't come to give God glory. He wants to show you that a better person. Uh, the, the things happening in my life, before it will happen in your own life, he go take. So he comes to show you. He comes to show you. But the Bible says they went praising God with simplicity of heart. It's not that they didn't have plans for their lives. But there was a level of trust in God. That means that if you came into the assembly, you will not know the one that had money and the one that did not have. You won't know. You could not tell the difference. That is how neat they were. The Bible even says that nobody said this one are my own, this one are your own. They had all things how? In common. In common. Now you can even go for program. We are afraid of ourselves because all manners of people have crept into our midst. So as you are leaving program, you, you are afraid to carry somebody in your car. He will kidnap you. Mm, because the message he heard on Sunday is my God is a God of money. So he has waited for that God to visit him for two years now. He, has not, he, he now needs to help God to help him. He knows that if he kidnaps you and uses you to do blood, he can still come and give tithe. The pastor won't ask him. We take all kinds of money here. All kinds of money. Sell go go and give God the tithe. Give it to Jesus. Do you know, just try, try, try. On 31st night, 31st night, that brutal at the NRA junction, they do crossover service. Eh? They do crossover service. They play worship songs. He has given me victory. I will lift him my there in that place. Waiting to cross over. Because I assure you that some of those people are in places where they attend services. And not once have they left the meeting with conviction. Not once. You, you check it. No, I want us to be very honest. Saturday mornings are for teaching. You check it. Look at the messages that were preached in certain places that you attended from January to December last year. Ask yourself, if you were a thief, a Yahoo ritualist, an adulterer, and you were attending that place from January to December, will you ever be convicted? Be honest. Will you ever be convicted? Will there be anything ever pushing you 
to change your conduct. 